about who we are. So the business that um, I founded and CEO of is Actus. <clears throat> I found that we started telling people what we actually did because people don't always know. So um, Actus is actually, we offer performance learning and talent management software and we offer training and consultancy. So if you're interested in any of those things, I've always got colleagues around who can talk to you more about that. Um, you know, if you, I'm not going to go into it here, but if you're looking for systems that are going to underpin your learning strategy, for example, or development needs, then often having the right software, particularly in a virtual world is useful. Um, the training that we do, we also offer, I run a change superhero training session. Next one's in, we've just finished one, will be in September. We also do virtual management training courses as remote sessions, which have been so popular over the last 12 months. And we've got a series of um, courses, which are e-learning uh, content, which are on the same topics. So if you want to know anything else that's like that, that might fit your learning strategy, then do consider having a look at what we offer um, as well, because it might fit. Anyway, what are we trying to get out of today? Well, we're going to talk about this uh, idea of what do we mean by learning culture? And actually, how has this changed over the last 12 months? What's the impact of COVID mean on it? A little bit about how and why people learn and just connecting back to that reality in terms of our learning strategies. Talk about how we can prioritise learning in a remote or a hybrid workplace and also linking this into career pathways um, and making that connection as to how those things might connect together. So, of course, the first question is, why is focusing on learning so relevant at the moment? Well, of course, um, there's quite a lot of data out there that says that people actually, well, I have to admit this is pre-COVID data, um, CIPD was the source. At the time, fewer than half of UK employees felt their job offered good opportunities for them to develop their skills. So what that, of course, means is we may well be losing people or if the um, economy picks up, then we may be having retention issues if people don't feel they're developing their skills within their job. We know that sometimes people felt that learning provision isn't always fit for purpose, particularly in, in implementing technologies. Only a third of learning practitioners um, surveyed by the CIPD in this data um, felt that they'd been able to engender a positive learning culture. I think that's an interesting one. I don't know how any of you feel. Have you got a learning culture? We'll be asking some polls in a minute and you'll be able to um, comment on that yourself. So I think what that also means, I think when I, many of you will know my background is learning and development. I spent 20, 25 years in internal learning and development roles. And I don't know that we taught, it was it's good 10 years ago, but I wouldn't say that people necessarily had a learning culture. It was a bit of a give me the training and I'll learn as opposed to people realizing um, that they'd learned. And that's maybe the subtle difference in terms of the world we're in now as to actually people have to find information out for themselves, particularly if they're in a hybrid position. So what is our role if we're in L&D and HR? Is it about delivering training? Is it about supporting with learning resources? Is it about all of these? Because of course, hybrid and remote working has forced us to develop new skills quickly. Uh, I, I was casting my mind back almost exactly a year ago. We did my book launch on Zoom and we had 100 people on Zoom. And honestly, I'm now I'm on, on Zoom. I think most of us are on some sort of technology, aren't we, every single day? Well, it was a minefield. We were running poll using all these things and it took about five of us to work out how to do it. So just think of the skills that we've been forced to develop over the last 12 months. But the key thing, again, is to remember is that development is a key aspect of employee engagement. Um, I think it's particularly important if you're in an organisation like, yeah, so let's say, the NHS or a, a charity or public sector organisations where you haven't got lots of salary to give people. And actually, it is low inflation time, so we don't have pay rises all over the place. But actually, people feeling an opportunity to develop and grow is one of the key aspects of engagement. And we know that engagement um, is correlates with many, many things from, as I said, earlier retention, but also um, productivity, performance and all those sides of things. Yeah, Mark, you're saying the whole volatility aspect of an organization's industry has come into greater prominence. So the need for employee capability has grown dramatically. Do you mean, um, Mark, that people are having to take on new skills in order to survive within their organisation, as in the requirements of industries have, have developed? By all means, type some more in on that, Mark. I know you've always got some good, in, some good observations to share. So tell me in the chat, 
what would you describe as a learning culture? After all, that is the conversation that we're here to discuss. What does learning culture mean to you? Or, or if you had a learning culture, what would you see in your organisation? Or what do you see in your organisation? Oh, great one, Emma, that growth mindset. So growth mindset is the great terminology that, that um, and I've forgotten the lady who it was, but it is about people being open to improvement and also taking risks, isn't it? So therefore we feel that we can carry on, um, we can make, feel free to make mistakes and people learning. Scott saying it's about people taking responsibility for their own development plan. Yes, I like that, uh, definitely. And Sarah saying a greater interest in self-directed learning. Carol Dweck, thank you, Vicky. Um, it's Carol Dweck, the, uh, the, the um, uh, growth mindset lady just in time learning so that's a bit about making sure people that's that's learning at the point of need um one of the there's a, a guy who's uh, really big in the learning field is lovely david james who always talks about um access to learning at the point of need so if you've got budget it's also about continuous professional development it is sam um people constantly learning that's brilliant there's lots, so many good definitions here and i can't keep up with them uh, Lisa, talk about, oh, hi, Lisa, psychological safety. Do you want to write a little bit more about what do you mean by that in relation to a learning culture where people feel safe to take risks, is it, in terms of continuing learning? Clear vision, says Emma, collaboration with diverse thinking and approaches, strong leadership. Yes, so this, some of this will come through when I go into the CIPD research as well um, on this. So love those, absolutely. All of those are super definitions. Um, and I'd say that they're as good, if not better, than the one I've got here which is a learning culture can be defined as an environment where learning is not only embedded, but encouraged across every level of the organization, right the way up and down, which I quite like that thought about it. Psychological safety where people simply can think freely, says Lisa, that's your definition. Yes, and that, that's got to feel to be able to learn. And that there's something there actually, isn't there, where, and your point, Helen, about leadership, which, I'm not going to go into so much in this session because this is actually more about what we would do from an L&D HR point of view. But it is something about I was I was on a session earlier with one of the clients and working with a number of clients um, with management development at the moment, and they don't have and they don't give feedback, so they haven't got a feedback culture at all, which actually means it feels like it's high risk. They don't I think they don't feel safe to either give feedback or receive feedback. And if you think about it there, that's almost the opposite of a learning culture because you're never going to get anywhere, are you, if you can't give and receive feedback, which links into our psychological safety piece. So CIPD um, research suggests that correlational links between a learning culture and growth, profitability, transformation and productivity. So you can see the link with engagement. If you ask me, those would be pretty much what you see in engagement. People are motivated to transfer learning. So it's, it's almost volunteering and supporting people with others. Knowledge management and sharing, which can link to um, organizational performance and skills, job satisfaction and organizational commitment. So you can definitely see, those of you who are looking for budget for learning, that there is a requirement here in terms of, or there's a benefit. Because again, L&D is always one of the hardest things to demonstrate a direct link isn't it in terms of return on investment but actually if you can see this correlation between having this learning culture where everyone's growing um, and all of these aspects then those do clearly link through to um, more strategic areas okay so we've defined learning culture pretty uh, effectively there now's our time to uh, think about it and this is anonymous no one's going to tell you anything no one's going to correct you let's see where do you think your learning culture is with my <laughs> my definitions there so do you definitely think you've got one have you almost got one you're almost getting there you've got little pockets of a learning culture or not really let us know what you think I love it Helen Wilson Laura Jelly saying hello to you Shelley. see networking happening in the chat I love it okay 55% have voted I'm just going to have a quick swig of my coffee while I let the votes go up Okay, that's 72%, it's still going up. A number of you have put in pockets. If you've put in pockets, tell me what you mean by that. Do you know exactly where the pockets are? Why is it in pockets? Interested to know why it's in pockets um, and maybe not more broadly spread. Have you thought about why that is? Um, interested to know. 
but tell us if you've gone in pockets of which 35 of you have. Tell us a bit more of that in the chat. Okay, 80% voted, it's now or never. I'll be five more seconds to go for it. And then I'll end the polling and share the results so we can all see what you've said. Okay, three, two, one, end polling, share results. So you can see actually almost 50% of you have gone in pockets. So 16% not really, got quite a way to go. 17, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm getting what, yes, 23% have gone almost and 14% have got it. So yeah, depending on what you put in there. So if you've got definitely, what are you really doing as well? Let us know um, more about why you've gone for it. Ah, so Sarah's saying pockets for you is where individuals have got the growth, don't it? Because that is dependent on managers and leaders of the specific divisions. So you're actually seeing that culture about learning is, is coming down. And is that about being safe to take risks or is it that they are encouraging training, Cosette? Yeah, okay, the feedback piece, Marie. Some leaders don't encourage their teams to feedback. Interesting that is, why are people like that? I think it's fear. I actually think that the leaders who are the least confident are the ones that um, are less, less open. It's almost they, they don't feel safe in themselves. So how could we encourage them to do that? Do we give them something like a positive experience with 360 feedback or something like that? It's in pockets because it's a management lottery. Yeah, that, that can be the case, isn't it? It's a shame. So very much we're getting leadership coming through as the reason for things being um, hit and miss. So Catherine, you're saying your team, your te the areas that are really good at it have got proactive tech teams who are innovative and need to be at the top of the game. The other thing about that, um, I think it's quite interesting is that they are intrinsically motivated, often techies. They just actually love doing the code or whatever it is. So it feels like fun. And actually techies have to learn a lot of time through trial and error. There's, it isn't like there's a textbook written for them. Um, so they've always had to be kind of self-sufficient, I think, if you're in that kind of role, to be coding or something. Nick has got some departments are really into it. They'll do reflecting and coaching. Others think it's an event. That's the classic, isn't it? You definitely see that coming through. OK, so you got, you're on a good journey there, Rachel. That looks really interesting. <clears throat> and you're diagnosing at the moment, doing your OD stuff. Oh, hi, Thomas. Um, you've got so it's about proactive colleagues for you, is it? So that's down to the individual. So individuals take ownership. So it's this proactive, reactive thing. So some of it's about the individual, and some of it is about um, the leadership in an organisation. Okay, so that's most of my first part. It's really interesting getting the context of it, and this is maybe slightly repetitive. I don't think it's too repetitive. So I'll put it up anyway. It was more kind of going into a bit more of a granular as to how you might describe that learning in your organisation. Because um, I think we've kind of referred to some of them in the, in the um, chat, actually. So if you are in your, in your organisation, um, you can choose more than one on this. So maybe choose one, two or three, obviously not all six. Um, which would you describe if you're going to describe learning in your organisation? Are you what, something like a financial services where people have got to do things like um, health and safety or money laundry or something like that, which actually people, it comes a bit tick boxy, or is it about having quite a reactive environment where people think that the training's got to come to them? Interesting to see what you see. And I, what I've probably got is some of these are not as positive as they might be. So I've put that one there, which says people are learning on their job, but expect formal development. But I could have also put people are learning on the job and being self-sufficient. Maybe that's the, that's the self-sufficient research. I'll just have a look at the chat while you're completing, we're up to 50%. So Mark saying, Agaris and, and I've noticed that resistance to learning can be about identity and perceptions of individual competence. Learning means you, yes, yeah, so um, so it's about your your own personal resistance. Yeah, so it, that does tie in, doesn't it, Mark, to um, our own perception and confidence about how safe we feel maybe to admit that we, it's almost like who'd put the hand up, oh, you know, it's about, is it admitting failure to ask a question if you don't know the answer? Yeah, accountability coming through. Interesting. Okay, so we are up to, I don't know why I've suddenly got a ding in my ears then. I think everyone's still there. <laughs> I'm going to end the polling in a moment. We've got 73%. I'll end it and share here. Let's have a look, share the results. So we've got lots of you feel that people are learning on the job, but expect formal development. Totally agree. And quite a bit of compliance. And those sort of things really can push against having a learning culture, can't they? 
So one of the things that I feel quite strongly about, which I'm not going to go into in great detail here, but again, in terms of our line managers, is taking the time to chat to our people, to use our coaching skills, to help people realise what they have actually learnt. Um, one of the one of the elements of actors in our in our software in the, the development tab, we always have on the job learning and actually get them to capture it because I think that's quite a good thing when you reflect and go, do you know what? Actually, I've learned loads. Or, you know, I've learned all about this. I had to go and research on career pathways or I've learned these things. But because we haven't formally gone on a training course, perhaps we're not completing and recognizing that we've learned something. And that leads me on to actually the next section here about how we actually learn information. So just thinking if we can get managers to coach people to reflect, that could be positive to help people realize that they are learning. So if I was to ask you, tell me in the chat, how do you learn best? Oops, just click back, click back. Okay, I'll get back to my slide. Tell me how you learn best. And I know I've got lots of L&D people here, so you're probably going to tell me your honey, honey and the learning style, but you don't need to be that scary. You can tell me anyways. Reading, watching and doing. <laughs> so Scott's gone read and reflect and Claire's gone by doing. And so uh, you can see that natural, um, that there's natural side of it. Trial and error. That's what, again, I was talking to developers yesterday, that point made earlier. And a lot of that is about being able to make mistakes. So trial and error there. You learn a lot more from making mistakes, don't you, even though they're painful, which is an interesting thing. Again, having this growth mindset, making it safe to YouTube. I know some people learn so much now from YouTube and, and doing, don't they? You can just Google things. Yeah, so interesting. We have got a reflection of this. So great. So I know the audience I've got here, this will not be the first. Oh, Colin, thank you. Um, this will not be the first time that you've come across this. There's different learning styles out there. Um, and actually, there's lots of people that critique learning styles, but I think they're talking about visual auditory and kinesthetic, which I don't consider necessarily to be a learning style, maybe a preference of things. This is Kolb's learning cycle. I was taught this at university, and I don't think it's been discredited. I went and re-looked it all up, and then it links into Honey and Mumford's, Honey and Mumford built on it, if you've ever heard of their learning styles, the activist, pragmatist, reflector. But essentially, I'm saying that actually most of us learn through experiential, or there's this whole message that a lot of learning is experiential but if we want to get through if we want to really consolidate that learning and use it then we have to reflect on the learning as a number of you doing theorize create a theory and think about how we're going to apply it and maybe put it into practice in future and so in principle you could start anywhere in a learning cycle if you are somebody who just likes to reflect you just sit and reflect you might create a theory try it out and then experience it if you're more naturally a reflector first or you might be the person that needs to leap in and do stuff. But the key is we need to make sure that we do reflect on it. And often people like myself actually who have quite a strong preference for doing, we can be guilty of just doing and doing and doing and then making the same mistakes because we don't actually take that chance to, to reflect and maybe work out what we need to do subtly differently or put something into action and apply it. Carol, does this sound like creating your own best practice? Yes, I think that is a better definition than theorizing. Yes, I, I would. I think it's about you thinking about um, how might you use it, when might I put that into practice, when might that be relevant, and then the application. Uh, so it's, it's coming up with a, a, a principle that you want to. It's almost um, a hypothesis. It's coming up with your hypothesis. Um, so that's it's that you want to, and then you put it into action or you test that hypothesis through the application stage. And I say, if any of you have come across the Honey and Mumford ones, he talks about we have preferences. So it said you've got activist, reflector, theorist, and pragmatist is the language that they have. And you might have an activist, pragmatist preference or a theorist, reflector preference. Any of these, the point with any of these things is it's just useful information. We do have preferences, we are different. But the key, as with many of these things, is being aware of those um, preferences means that we can also be alert to our gaps. Now, why am I sharing this? Because it's quite personal. Well, I think the key here is, as line managers, it's about us helping people around this cycle. It's about us completing the loop. So, um, I, again, so I was training yesterday with some guys who are in a high tech place, and they're a lot of them chemists and in labs, and they were saying what their job actually, what they felt they needed to do, they are literally coaching people or pulling people around that cycle um, to make sure that they're doing those things. Colin, you're so right, aren't you? You learn more when you're creating training material and then when you run it. 
you learn so much more when you've actually got to be an expert and people ask you questions about things you realize how much um yeah you have to process it in a different way in fact my daughter is doing exams at the moment she's lower six and she's being taught that um she's making notes is not a useful way of learning um which i suppose is kind of reflective theory it's, it's said what you need to do is you need to write questions problem is she's written questions and hasn't categorized them as lost and put them in bad files so you need to also be organized but um, by writing questions you've got to think about it more intently to create something into a question and then obviously testing that recall because you've got to you've got to complete the cycle and then to get it into your long-term memory you've got to revisit it um, and process it well as in in, the, um, in addition to that the other, uh, so that's about how we learn um, individually. The other um, piece of research that I came across, this is actually 2018. So this was pre-COVID. It was showing a digital shift. So this was based on research into 1500 um, professionals. And it was showing that, whereas we used to talk about the 70-20-10 model, that the shift is very much towards social learning. So that's quite activist, isn't it? Um, and I think social learning, you could probably say, would include um, things like uh, yeah, social media, but chat, reaching out to people and um, sharing information in those ways. It may be just that that social piece, I, and I don't know what you think of this data because it doesn't dig into it in any more detail than this, is that, um, that we're actually, perhaps because of collaboration technologies, we're able to learn more than doing and mistaking, getting mistakes maybe, the on the job being the sort of trial and error. Um, interested to see what you make of those it's sort of it's, it's i was seeing it as becoming more even really and actually look at the fact that we might have said that actually less of it was formal whereas the 10 percent in the 70 20 10 model was about sort of face face actually some of this is formal um people were seeking out formal learning but maybe that's about the availability of short courses where would webinars sit into this now I'm starting to question this. I'm not sure how useful it is. I'll have to put the link in to show you where I got it from. It's quite a nice little infographic. Anyway, let's look at what you're doing because this is relevant to you in your organisation. So how would you say your people have been learning over recent, um, uh, yeah, over the remote working times? Let's have a look. Let me get my um, poll up. What would you say the most common um, learning styles and again you can choose more than one if you want so and this is an interesting one actually because I've seen I think e-learning has improved since like when I was in an, in organizations having said at the start we've got e-learning which we have and actually um, I think it's decent e-learning um, as somebody who's an activist it's quite um, active um, but uh, I have to say when I was in Siemens I hated e-learning I thought it was the most boring thing in the world so I think if these technologies have, have moved on and improved quite a bit I'm saying that's quite a few of you put e-learning as you'll see in a moment um how do you think people are learning and that do-it-yourself googling and videos there's a lady in our team I'm not sure if she's on the call actually Helen um who is absolutely brilliant often with these technical things if we have a, an issue that needs fixing on the website or um you know, one of the sort of techie things, she just goes and Googles it and finds out the answer on YouTube and comes back and fixes it. Now, I'm not very good at that because I think maybe I'm a bit too impatient to watch the videos. Maybe it's more my failing, but um, I'd rather trial and error and get frustrated. So have you all had a chance to respond? I've got up 73%. Let's see how we are sharing 77%, how people have been learning. Yeah, interestingly. It's a bit damning on books, isn't it? <laughs> I've got to admit, I can't remember the last time I probably read a book. I am using audio books, though. Does that count? Um, and we should have podcasts, shouldn't we? We maybe say external webinars, live content. You could put podcasts. So we're seeing the vast majority of people are reaching outside external webinars and live content. And that's like this, isn't it? So it's interactive. It is more, well, we're trying to make it more interactive. Again, webinars, how boring used they to be? Um, and uh, obviously, as you know, I try very hard to make these interactive because I think you're going to learn more from it. Plus, frankly, I would go to sleep myself if I was just talking completely at you and not getting any feedback at all. But lots of do-it-yourself, Googling and videos, and a lot of e-learning. Interested. So have you, just in the chat, have you got more e-learning? Yeah, okay, so exactly, Emma. So e-learning is much more interactive and social than it used to be. There's so much more you can do now. We've got on our platform, you can make interactive video as well. So Again, it's less, I suppose this is the thing, as some of you have got reflective preferences from the chat, some of us are activists, and I think the key is making sure that it's something that can appeal to both preferences. 
Yeah, it can be very boring, can't it, Marie? Um, yeah, and that, I think that's the problem. Then it becomes a tick box if it is something that you are just having to painfully go through, or you're just getting going forward, forward, forward to the test at the end. Um, so that's the worst kind of e-learning. So it is worth it if we're going to put our e-learning out there that we make it as engaging as possible and challenging. Well, wouldn't we all like a sunny holiday by the pool, Colin? Totally. Okay, so how do we assess our current culture? So this goes back to, if you want to see the root information of this, this I went and got this from the good old CIPD website, and they were talking about learning cultures. And they say you can assess your own learning culture at three levels, organisational level, team learning, and individual learning. If it's at organisational level and you want to assess it, these are the sort of questions that you should be asking yourself. So first of all, would you say there is a clear vision for learning that is supported by the leadership and aligned with business strategy? The other thing is about how can you align that learning to roles or career development? So we're talking about, yeah, there can be more challenging there, but how do you think about making sure that something um, is more strategically aligned either to the business strategy or to people's individual roles or job families so they can see the purpose? You might learn something in order to go to the next level. It's also saying, is reflection on lessons learned on, or constructive challenge positively encouraged? So this goes back to you talking about psychological safety. Is risk and experimentation encouraged? Is learning invested in, in time and resources? And actually, time is a massive one. Maybe less so now, but again, back in the day of traditional training courses was where people would be you know, invested in, sent on a leadership development program, and then their manager would say, oh, I'm sorry, you're too busy, you can't go on it. And they'd get pulled off it. Um, so that would be something where, you know, the opposite of learning culture there. Of course, now, have we got, are we encouraging people to spend time when, even when they're working remotely, to spend some time on their own development and learning? Um, and is it passive compliance driven or driven or available at the point of need? So some good questions to ask if you're thinking about learning culture in your organisation, you could put those up with your board, you know, and say, you know, where are we in our culture? You could put a measure um, against each of those, couldn't you, and rate your organisational level. The next level is at manager or team level, um, and this is about the behaviours of the managers. So are the managers buying into and supporting the time spent on formal or informal training? Have they had training themselves? Do they role model it? Are they showing that they're actually learning too? And do they possess coaching skills to su support self-discovery? So are they able to coach? And it amazes me actually how much this, this varies. So this very week, I've done two lots of management development training, um, one in this technical startup company, and they were really good at coaching. Interesting, I think it was because quite a lot of them were academic and had done PhDs and were managing other highbrow individuals. So you couldn't be patronizing and sort of top down. The other really, um, a, you know, a bank actually, a, a small bank, but um, a financial services bank, and 50% of the people didn't know what an open question was just goes to show how different that can be. So even though that might be a very basic skill for this audience, actually not everybody does know it. I'm keeping an eye on the chat there, so as your other stuff there, instructor-led instructor instructor -led online delivery is becoming your preference, is it, Dave? That's interesting. Is that because it's it's live? Um, and is it is it, do they make it interesting? What kind of, what kind of training is that? Because instructor-led sounds a bit like technical, is it? Um, tell us what you mean by that. Shorter sessions, toolbox tools. Yes, absolutely. That's social, isn't it, as well, Debbie? So things like these little lunchtime learns, knowledge shares, more of this sort of thing. Oh, sorry, Raj. What did what did what did I miss? What did, what do you want me to say again? I apologise. I've no idea what I said again because I've just seen that bit. Which slide was it? This slide, Raj, that you wanted me to explain um, more? T put in the chat, and I'll try and explain what it is that I've gone and I maybe I'll slow down a little bit it was the organizational side you will get the slides back all I was saying here is that I think that you could probably look at those questions and rate them against in your own organization give, maybe give yourself a naught to ten and see where you think you are currently you could benchmark yourselves um, and then uh, look at what you might want to do if you wanted to, to improve it and then at an individual level you know do are people are taking ownership this is this is have you got a passive or a reactive or a proactive culture um are people aware of formal or informal learning opportunities and feel empowered to access them do they hold themselves accountable for their own development do they know where to find this development um and consider it to be relevant and of value 
and do they understand how they learn best? So I feel like these, these could be questions. You could survey your organization, you could benchmark, couldn't you, in this kind of thing. Make, does that makes sense, um, David. Yeah, so the instructor needs to make stuff alive and interesting, definitely. And that's really hard with process, process and procedure training. That is uh, that can be challenging. Then um, just a slide here about aligning learning to career pathways. This is something that I did in my previous life. And it's based on a book I was going to write. Yeah, this book is about 20 years old. It's actually, I think it's a really good book. I'm going to do a podcast episode on, um, on it, on career pathways. And it talks about the leadership pipeline. And we built, part of it is about actually just making sure that the transition from individual contributor um, to people in terms of people, they don't always make that move in terms of line management. So maybe you end up with line managers talking about skills of line managers who don't really want to be line managers and therefore they may not be motivated to coach or, um, or other ways. So that in itself can cause a challenge. But it might be a career pathway for, you know, if you've got financial team of people in finance and you're a large organisation, then you might put in a career pathway of skills that people need to learn or project management. Any technical um, pathway, you could do the same effect and work out what are the skills at, at each level. You can do it in small businesses as well. Um, you just need to be a little bit more creative about it. But what we did here was um, we essentially, we, I said this was my, my team, we were a learning development. Um, this was a role to do with sort of classic management. So this is linked to this leadership pipeline. We mapped our organization and identified that there were certain skills that needed to be developed as people went up the organization. And in fact, we obviously had people in situ, let's say a functional manager who should have been operating strategically who would act very tactically. Um, for example, a sales manager who would you know, dive down and talk directly to the customer and you know, cut out three levels of management when he really shouldn't have done. So he wasn't operating at the right level. And that's because these people hadn't been skilled up to develop their skills at each of those levels. So the Leadership Pipeline book basically said this is the kind of key performance indicators at each level. So the first level is achieving performance targets. The second level team leader is about getting results through people. Then as you go up the next level, it, it is about getting results through people, but you're managing managers. So you've got broader responsibility. So you need to take on things like financial skills and things you need to be involved in. And you need to be a little bit more um, indirect in terms of delivering results. And you can read the rest for yourself. You could define these levels up your organization. And then what my team did was we developed different skills and courses at each level. Now this is large business, so we had cohorts of people going through things, but we had at this stage, for example, we had our impact course, which was about someone who was demonstrating high performance. And it was about, you know, things like um, influencing skills and time management and all the high performance essential skills. They then, to get into team leaders, they went through a mini assessment center. Once someone became a team leader or potentially if they were pipeline to a team leader, the Engage program was essential management skills, management skills 101, basically the sort of stuff that I'm training people on now, which is interesting because there are managers at, right at the top who've never, ever had management 101 training. We know in the UK, there's an awful lot of that that goes on. Then people um, in this organisation, they then got the next level of skills, things like cost centre um, analysis. And then when you got to the top, it was much more customised around the individual. So people would get things like um, masterclasses on certain topics. They might have got 360 feedback, executive coaching, or their development would be through the mentoring others. Now, that was just how we did it. It's just an example. But the point was that the, the development was appropriate to that particular career path for line managers. And you can do exactly the same thing for a career path for any other um, function that, um, that you want to, to map that onto. So one final po um, poll before we jump onto our takeaways. Oops. And again, so we've talked about what you are doing and it's giving you some more options as to what you're doing in your organization. Let's see what the predominant, um, the predominant training or learning is that you're offering maybe there are other things that you could think about so some of you were talking about I'm talking about lunch and learns team sharing are managers coaching are we giving skills to managers to make sure that they see that they are part of 
the learning culture? Could you set up a, a mentoring program? If you do want to set up a mentoring program, I did a specific podcast all about that. And there's also downloads on that, which um, I won't ask Caitlin to put in the chat because I've just put that. I'd be amazed if she's got that to hand because I read that just came off the top of my head. But um, that is there as well if, if we've got that we've got lots and lots of downloads if you haven't visited our active site there's loads and loads of resources um, and these sort of things that uh, might be useful because it's got a mentoring contract in there and one of the podcasts I did was on that topic specifically okay so we've got 60 percent anyone else want to go any more for any more and I'll end the polling and get going because I want to let you go okay I'm going to go five four three two one 50 of you voted almost share the results so so compliancy learning oh it's not going to set the world on fire is it it's directly available um in there oh well done Caitlin you've spot, you've managed to get it that you pulled that one out of the bag um team sharing and trainings there managed to go so so actually there's a real spread that you've got there so I suppose my challenge back to you is then if you have got a predominance in, in one of those could you use any more of them? Are there any other options that you could use? Any new ideas? And actually, what what haven't I thought of there? What other great training is going on um, in there that you could share? So practical learning takeaways um, that I would suggest is do step back and evaluate your overall learning environment that exists already. Maybe do some sort of assessment of it. You've used those um, ideas, some of those prompts on the slides about that. Um, think about how to align the need for learning to business need. So although we talked about career paths there, um, again, you've got to prioritise, right? You can't do everything. So maybe where's the biggest pain point in your organisation and work out how to align your learning to that. Maybe consider how varied is it? Or, you know, could you offer other types of learning um, to get greater engagement in there? Um, do you want to link it to pathways? Just, is there anything that you want to do to refresh, revitalize, normalize, or incentivize learning? Although I would um, say be cautious about incentivizing learning because I was told a story last time I did this similar topic of somebody who then just, because they so liked the gamification of the learning, all they did all day was learning. Um, but I'd say start simple, although we've thrown lots of content at you, um, maybe just start simple, reflect and review, and perhaps pick one or two ideas that might be useful for you. So hopefully that is useful. Um, what we'll do is I'll drop her and please, if anyone's got any specific questions, because I'll go back through the chat, but I'm conscious that we've got to 14, 13. So any questions, please pop them in the chat. That's um, where you can get the conduct a white paper on succession planning. If that's of, of use to you, that's where you can download that. Caitlin will drop her a feedback form in the chat. The feedback's really useful for me. If you can just give us a bit of feedback, whether this has been useful, how valuable it was, and also if there are other topics that you'd like us to cover. Um, and these are the webinars coming up in June. So um, I'll let you read those, but basically performance management in a hybrid world, um, managing performance and engagement, virtual management training courses, that's other information, there's, but there are other ones coming up. There's, there's actually four coming up in, in, um, in June. So there's quite a lot going on at the moment. It's busy. And other resources, we send these out to you. So you, if you, you can get hold of those, but these resources are particularly relevant to learning. So yeah, that was a nice one with Ross Garner of um, Good Practice Podcast, if any of you know those. And lots of these links are just coming in so you can grab them really easily. Well done, um, Caitlin. So you can just grab those out of the chat there. So um, I think that's it. I'll leave those up there. Do link in with me if you're not already. There's all my details. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you very much for the nice comments. It's really kind of you. I'm really pleased um, if it's useful. If there's any questions, please feel free. If you can have a moment to give us a bit of feedback in the feedback form, then that's helpful. Um, and you can grab things too. Super. Great. Thank you so much. I'll keep an eye for a moment or two. I'll wait until 14.15 and then I'll close it down there. There's the feedback forms just popped in now.